<laughs> okay, uh, so if anyone, by the way, restrooms are one flight down, and if people want, please feel free to get drinks and refreshments uh, during the talk if you'd like. Um, I am deeply honored uh, and uh, delighted to introduce my friend and colleague, Nancy Dubler. Nancy's one of my favorite bioethicists. Uh, she's not only smart and uh, heartfelt, but she's wise, which is rare, all too rare. She is a professor emerita at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Montefiore Medical Center. Uh, she's been a consultant on ethics for the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. She's also an adjunct professor at NYU now. Uh, she's written widely. Uh, I know her best probably because we're both on the New York State Stem Cell Commission, but she's uh, done many wonderful things for many years and have a wide variety of topics. Uh, and please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much, Dr. Klitzman. What a nice invitation and how nice to be here. Um, this is not a lecture. Uh, so I do clinical ethics consultation. And the question is, what is that? How many of you think that you do clinical ethics consultation? No, oh, come on, David does. We have a lot of Craig does. Here, but... Bob does. <laughs> yeah, Lisa. Yeah, okay. What do you do? It's for you, Bob and Craig, too. What do you do? I'm trying to figure out what the dilemma is, first and foremost. Oftentimes, it's not a dilemma, and it's a conflict that needs to be resolved, resulting, in my experience, from failures in communication. Okay. That's a pretty, and I think pretty reasonable answer. Figure out what the dilemma is. It's often not a dilemma, but a conflict. And then figure out how to solve it. Uh, I think that's a kind of fair generalization. Dig down a little bit more for me. We listen to people if we're doing our job well, and we facilitate. Listen and facilitate, very important. I would add one more step. Mediate. Sit down. <laughs> right? So here are families and patients. They've been in the hospital for who knows how long, and no one's ever sat down to talk to them. They run in and they run out and they all look pretty much the same in their white coats. So you listen and you facilitate, but you sit down. What are you worried about when you come in as a consultant? What are you worried about? What concerns you? What's on your list of things? Lots of seats, and you can even sit in the front because I don't call on anybody. I know everyone heads for the back. First rule of going to a meeting, sit in the front and don't give up your coat. Craig. Making it worse, okay. Um, I think that's a good concern. Uh, it, it's not on high on my list because my experience is if you listen and you facilitate and you sit down, you're highly unlikely to make it worse because the things you're doing are in facilitating listening and sitting down basically not aggressive. If you're aggressive, you can make things worse. Um, medical interventions often make things worse. Bioethics shouldn't, but do no harm, obviously, sits around someplace in your head. Okay, what are the concerns do you have? Slow things down a little. I mean, 
sometimes there has to be a rush, but often if the rush is due to the fact that the resident has to leave in five minutes and there's 20 other patients, you can resolve it by slowing it down. Okay, slowing thing down. I'm a big believer in slowing things down, although medicine in tertiary care hospitals has a rhythm to it. And either you're going to get with that rhythm and have an effect on what's happening, or you're going to left aside. So yes, you can slow things down. But if you get off the schedule of what the decision is, you're irrelevant. One big concern that I um, wouldn't be able to discern is that what the patient wants. Well, that's, that's a real problem. Um, our friend Ken Berkowitz, who does bioethics in the VA system, sees patients all the time over years and knows what they're about and what they're thinking about and what their families are. We usually get patients in acute illness where nobody knows them, where they're often moribund, perhaps obtunded, not communicative. Um, very easy to step over the patient's concerns. So I would group all of those concerns into uh, issues of power. What most concerns me in clinical ethics consultation is not exercising my privilege and power in a way that undercuts the rights and interests of other people. And uh, one of the amazing things as I look at this class, so 45 years ago when I started in bioethics, the notion that you would have a face of color in your class was unbelievable. And it's terrific to go now to bioethics classes and in general to hospitals and see how the workforce has changed. But what really concerns me as an old civil rights lawyer are differentials of power. Because we are elite, privileged, we speak the same language that nobody else speaks. Uh, we know where to find what we want to find. We have the keys to the secret garden that patients and families don't have. And it is in that differential of power, I would suggest to you, that bioethics can be the most alert and aware. Now, if I knew what to do here to bring up my first slide, <laughs> ah, fantastic, uh, excellent. Um, so this is a real case. It's needless to say been anonymized, so you can't tell patient, family, hospital, or system, or you can probably guess at the later. Um, I hate reading slides, but there's no other way to do this. So 68-year-old Hispanic female with dementia, multiple medical problems, transferred from a nursing home with dry gangrene of the right foot evaluation for possible amputation, patient refused amputation, consultation was called to evaluate that refusal. Sound familiar? Real case. I didn't make this one up, but it is the generic bioethics hospital nightmare, your basic bioethics nightmare. Uh, what you're looking at is what I dictate as the schema for clinical ethics consult notes at health and hospitals. 
So we now have clinical ethics consult review of chart notes since it's my commitment that the only way to evaluate a consult is to review the chart note unless you're going to have people actually at the consult, which I've tried and failed to ever be able to do. So we evaluate the chart note as a way of evaluating the consult. And this is the structure we use in the chart note. So reason for consultation, ethically relevant medical facts. Take a look at that and look up when you've read it. I didn't make this up. I couldn't make this up. <laughs> right, right. Pick a day, any day. You'll find this patient on one of your floors. Everybody done ethically relevant medical facts. What do you want to know at this point, if that's all you know about the patient? Why is she refusing? OK. What is her understanding of the implications of not having the amputation? OK. All reasonable questions. Tell them about her family or pastor. Yep. You're all great consultants. You're all exactly on the right track. Let's see if I can move the slide. Oh, look at that. OK, take a look at this. All right, look up when you're done reading. Nancy, I love the phrase, main sibling. That speaks volumes. Where is that? Uh, just below Robert in the second paragraph. I spoke with her brother, Robert, yesterday. He states he is not the main sibling, but still he participated. Isn't that great? I mean, when you get a phrase like that, you know it's real, right? Because nobody talks like that who hasn't actually said it. So I love that. Hey, I'm not the main one, guys, but OK, you got me. But I'm not giving consent to anything because they didn't call me with the right stuff. Got that? OK. This is a lengthy one. Remember, this is all in the chart note I got. If your chart notes don't tell this kind of story, up the ante. Because you'll understand at the end of this what's going. This is a big one. I'll shut up while you read. So this is the current surgery. This is the past. She eventually agreed to have the surgery. When the workup was completed, she went to the holy. She said, not me. I'm out of here. She went back to the nursing home. What does obtunded mean? Obtunded is where you're, you're uh, I'm not a doc. Oh, I'm not responsive. It's on the spectrum of a level of consciousness. Right. Leave a little bit before you're in a coma, but you ain't there. So you can respond to uh, deep not, pain not stimulation, not. right? And it sounds like she's responding to questions. Well, she was before she went to the nursing home. Now she's back, guys. The grand wave is worse. They didn't get it. Oh, 
sure it's how you can wax them in. Oh, okay. So that's, that's what you're saying. Now, by the end of this slide, you should have some questions about process. Okay, if you're peer reviewing this chart note as a way of improving the clinical ethics consultation in your service, what do you pick up? Well, it seemed like clear to me why she's against it. In other words, is it just put, I don't want. I don't want it. Does she understand the consequences of not having it? The statement says. Unclear. Psychiatric diagnosis. It mentions dementia. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to move to the next slide and then open the discussion. Is this your voice here? Nope. No, oh, oh, nope. Oh, it's all, <coughs> this is all the chart note, all the consultant. So she finally tells us why. Do you believe her? I mean, there's a story being told here, right? And so the story is she wants two things. She wants to live and not be bothered at the same time. One of the questions we're not asking is to what extent is doing this procedure really going to help her? Mm -hmm. Which I think is an important other side of the equation. After the surgery is over, She's septic, but she's refusing her biology. Well, chances are she's not going to live very long. And she perceives that she was forced to have this first surgery. But no, she's surgery. never had surgery. The first, she says she was She's saying they were trying to force her. She they were trying to force her. Right. She's now the first came in, right. first admission, said no at the surgery door. Back to the nursing home, comes in again. But if you wanted to say, OK, you clinical ethics consultant who was in charge of this, what would you do differently next time? Where does the narrative send you? I, you know, I, what, I'm hear, what I'm hearing in this is uh, a story about trust. And I wonder, as, as a clinical ethicist, I might ask her about, well, you know, the doctors told you that they, they needed to do this last time. You refused and went back to the nursing home. So in some ways, you were right. You didn't really need to have the nursing You didn't really need to have the surgery. And now you're back again. And these doctors are saying you need it again. I wonder what do you think about that. Do you trust the doctors? Do you think that they're right? Do you think that, it, that, uh, that you, know, you might have other ideas about how you might get healthy? So to, you know, to really explore what her health beliefs are, how much are they tied into her spiritual beliefs, to what extent does she trust? I mean, to think about this power differential, I mean, we know that a lot of times when patients hear prognostic information, in fact, they don't even believe it, that they have other ideas about what their prognosis is, and that's been empirically studied. So to what extent does she believe the doctors? Does she have issues with trust? And so forth. So I'm, I'm, I think there's some, some, some part of the story, I think, would, would I'd want to drill down a little bit more about that. I hear very simply that she's screaming out to be left alone and she kind of gets it and the physicians trying to help her are focused on what they're worried about mm -hmm. and she gets it enough if you ask me if you tell the story I'd rather die than have my leg cut off <coughs> but this patient remember I don't know if you remember from the first slide I, I, I 
forgive me for doing this, but I'm never comfortable giving out uh, what are redacted chart notes on pieces of paper. So uh, there's early on, there's a clinical psychiatric that she's without capacity. Um, and they could be, they could be wrong. They're often wrong. It's a, it's a combination of messages over time yep. that tells her story. So she may not have had capacity the day she refused, but she has ideas about what people are trying to push her to do and ideas about what she wants to do and what she'll accept. To me, that's the story. I'm sure so to me, I mean, I'm just wondering psychiatrically, she sounds paranoid. I mean, is she a schizophrenia? I mean, is, is there a psychiatric history? It's is not clear. And it doesn't get to the power differential directly, but. Sounds like a demented old lady who was trying to take a red light. She's 68. I, so. I mean, that no, is a dementia. So she. <coughs> well, she is, Again, but for so he's wondering if the dementia is, is caused by some other kind of psychiatry. It might be. If there's something that you can treat psychiatrically right. and get her, get her away from that capacity issue. Yeah. She's a vasculopath. You don't get to be this, have, have a life threatening need to cut off the leg by being healthy. So her brain is not any healthier than her leg. That's a great comment. You know, it's kind of, at the end of the day, I don't think she would live very long in the way. Well, that's what I was interested in. This is who she is. That's right. uh, this is how she presents. Her, her vascular structure in her head is probably some, some reflection of the vascular structure in her leg. Um, I'm impressed by the fact that she's consistent over time. So uh, I trot this out occasionally. The more classical capacity commentators reject this comment I'm about to give you, which is consistency over time can do the task of capacity in certain circumstances. Now, value well, Applebaum, for one, thinks that's a really garbage proposition. <laughs> but, um, and I understand that because his position relates to an in-the-moment assessment of the skills and tools that someone brings to the in-the-moment problem. And what I'm more impressed with is an overall approach to life, which someone has brought to life over time, and which they bring to the present with the same acuity or lack of acuity that they brought in the past. So I, I always like that, but I have to tell you what the critique on the other side says. But let's move on a little and see uh, where we go. So there's the end of her narrative. Um, I would say one other thing in the narrative, which was when we finally got to her sisters, and that was, for me, the great lack in this page of the chart note. We know there are two sisters out there, and the brother says, hey, guys, not me. I'm not the one you want to talk to. It's the sisters. And when we get to them, they're really clear. This is the way she's been. Never wanted surgery. Never wanted to be messed with by medicine. She's the wreck she is because she was totally non-adherent with her medical regimen over time. And you know, I, I, you're not going to cut our sister because she doesn't want that. Well, uh, that lurked to me in this chart note. And in fact, when they got to the sisters, that's what they said. So query. Um, we've done a lot of talking, and we haven't mentioned much of the word ethics. 
which for me is good. <laughs> when I read a chart note that says autonomy, beneficence, non-malfeasance, or justice, I send it back <laughs> to be rewritten. I don't want any of those comments in my chart notes. I want to know what happened and why. But then you get to a point, this is a clinical ethics consultation. There's a reason we wear a tag. And uh, so the question is, what are the ethical issues that lurk in this case? And how would you go about thinking about them? And how would you go about writing about them? Because again, in the H&H &H format, which we now have on Epic, bless our souls. <laughs> Three years it took us to get this thing on Epic, but it really works. And one of the things we have is a drop-down set of paragraphs on clinical ethics issues that you can pull up and excerpt in your chart note so that it's very, you're welcome to it. I give it to anybody who wants it. Just call me, we send it to you. So what are the ethical issues that you want to take a look at? I have to tell you, I never made any money in my life, and this is why. <laughs> when my husband says, why are you giving it away rather than selling it? It's because I have no instinct or ability to do the latter, so I do the former. <laughs> so what it, the next section in your chart note has got to be ethical analysis. I mean, you're in ethics. What are the ethical issues in this case? Well, something that bothers me in this kind of case is when you have a patient who they bring psychiatry and they say they're not, they lack capacity. Okay, fine. So then you're going to do what they say, even though you think it's the wrong thing. Blah, blah. I mean, why ask for capacity? You can think about it, but sometimes maybe better not to do it. Oh, no, not it. sometimes. It's not, it's not, Always. Let's just not do it and not go. Always it. better. Now you're stuck in this ethical position. Always better not, not to like call that. for a clinical psych. So why does the family sue and sue? No, no, the families don't. The families don't. There is the hospital policies do. Or the internist sphere. Or the internist sphere does. Mm -hmm. So you know what? I don't I'll, I'll take the counterpoint to that. It's even clearer what the ethics role is when someone, whether it's a psychiatrist or another physician, has said the patient lacks capacity, it still is about figuring out, okay, now we know that. What do we do? Right. So it brings that to focus even sometimes more clearly. Well, the point is this. Dubler's first, no, Dubler's second role. The hit and run liaison psychiatrist never makes your job easier. So if you can avoid it, don't do it. I mean, someone shows up at 6 o'clock at night when your patient is sundowning, and the patient is fine at 10 in the morning, but this guy's there at 6 at night and then puts a note in the chart that the patient does not have decisional capacity and you're toast, so why do it? So I'm quietly trying to change all of the H&H &H hospital policies, but it's a push, guys, because for years that's what the tradition was. So. The first issue that you want to talk about in your chart note is capacity. I think she has a tiny little bit of capacity. On what do you base that? Right there. Because she is able to express a preference over time, and because she is telling a story that is consistent with her personality, which is her values and her priorities and preferences. And it may only be a teeny little bit, but probably enough. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I also think that this whole idea of capacity is, I think it's also, if someone is deemed incapacitated, for example, then, it's, then people who, who seem to have capacity 
they really don't have capacity as to that person and the situation that person is in. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Because, because that individual is going through something that someone who has capacity cannot relate to. So they really don't have the capacity then. So it's capacity for what? Yeah. In what context? That's really always the question. So um, the writer of this chart note <clears throat> actually chose capacity as the first issue to analyze in the ethical analysis and excerpted what you're reading from one of the paragraphs. There is a six paragraph discussion of capacity, decision making capacity, and this is the bare bones of it. But my thought over the years has been, rather than writing that from scratch, every time I write a chart note, come on, guys. So now I pull it out of the ethers, and I plunk in that piece that I think fits the chart note. Lisa, you going to say something? I was going to say something earlier. I don't think it's relevant now. But I, to the consistency, I felt that her, when she brought up God, and it's, I felt that, that people were hounding her so much that for a reason, for not doing it, that she finally got to, like, OK, <laughs> I, I'm religious. <laughs> and then the other thing that, that wasn't, there was a line right in the back in the slide you just had, that she may not trust the team. And this may not be captured by the notes, but it, it feels like that everybody there was pushing, all, the whole medical team was pushing an agenda, which is to cut off this foot. Hey, um, what did I call my talk way about in the beginning? Differentials yeah. of power? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much more of a differential do you want than the surgeon with the knife on the one hand, and this little old lady who barely manages her life on the other. I mean, picture the slicing angels of defiance coming down. I mean, here's this little old lady, and she gets to the OR twice and says, no, got to hand it to her. I mean, but she didn't have enough support in her corner. That's my problem with this ethics consult. It didn't balance out that differential of power. Now, surgeons, any surgeons here? Yeah. Surgeons don't do well with contests to their authority. You don't go into surgery because you're a warm fuzzy. You go into surgery because you've got a job to do and you're going to do it. And they do their jobs well. But it's very hard for patients. And I felt in my critique of this chart note, which meant my critique of the consultation, that there wasn't enough support for this lady, that she really almost had to do it on her own. And God bless, she did it. You, know, you asked before uh, to think about what, what's the, the ethical analysis here or the dilemma here. And I might have even started um, at, at, a, at a counterfactual for this case to just to sort of put everything into perspective. So, you know, I absolutely agree that there's this power differential and that, you know, there's, there's that all going on all the time and how we can best support the patients so that we can you know, mitigate that. But if you were to take the, the counterfactual, okay, let's, what's at stake here is this idea that we could do something to her body, namely amputate, over her objections based on some grounding in saving her life acting at, you know, and serving her best interest, which she's, you know, presumably not aware of, not able to articulate, versus honoring her preferences, autonomy, something, um, something of that, akin to that. 
um, and which you know which are we going to go you know forward with? So if I if I were to go you know forward with the former and say we do have this right to take off her leg to save her life from a physician's act of beneficence trying to act in her best interest, I would say, well that's that's funny. That seems a bit that seems a bit of a strong. You know, I would need a lot more evidence, a lot more evidence, to convince me that that's the right thing to do, right? Um, and that it wouldn't be such an easy, it wouldn't be such a slam dunk at all. In fact, it would require a, a, a very high bar. That is to say, her sisters would have to weigh in and say she has no idea what she's talking about. In fact, she's always wanted to do surgery, or she's very concerned about you know, living as long as possible. She doesn't really care about her looks. She doesn't care about her, you know. I would need a very high level of, of um, evidence to really over, overturn her objections, which are coming out of you know, if you break down capacity into sort of these components, it comes out of, you know, this consistency over time. That's the volitional aspect, right? Maybe she doesn't have the cognitive aspect, she might not have the rational aspect. Okay, fine. But she has this volitional aspect. Do we yep. have enough evidence to overweigh, to overturn this volitional, you know, uh, request on her part to leave me alone? When you think mm -hmm. of the Schlondorf case, and it's like, you know, if this would appear back then, you know, would they hold such a high regard for this level of capacity, or is it enough to just say, don't cut off my leg? And that was the spirit of Cordozo's ruling in that case. I don't know, I mean, I, I, I defer that to you, uh, but I, my sense is that that would probably have been enough, that they wouldn't care quite as much about having the cognitive and the rational mm -hmm. piece. It's enough to say, no, don't touch my leg. And I would need a lot more evidence to overrule that. Um, and so all this other business about trying to, to weigh in on you know the, the sort of the whether or not she has to pass or not. I think it's, it's almost not not an issue in my mind because I would need a lot more evidence in any case if we say she doesn't have capacity. Does that make sense? Yes, but and I'll give you my but. There's no developed tradition in medicine to oppose the surgical removal of a gangrenous leg. <clears throat> The standard of care would be gangrenous leg, not responding to antibiotics, remove gangrenous leg. Right. That's That's kind of to that when you take a pause, I think. So having seen a, a lot of these sometimes after the leg is removed and the person wakes up, mm -hmm. and sometimes before in this scenario, I actually, it's the notion around power is the focus of our discussion. I think we gave this patient too much burden in the form of power. In other words, I agree with you. I think that you could, we haven't established that it is actually in her interest. If her goal is to live as long as she can live, she's not set to get at all. This surgery could actually shorten her life. I'm sure that we could line up a, vascular, a number of vascular surgeons that would say, I thought I had to, but I would really be thrilled if I didn't. So to me, the question here is whether we should even, it certainly needs to be offered, but it should be recommended with clarity. In other words, it's just as likely that you'll die sooner. This lady will not heal. Uh, so probably. She, so she may never leave the ICU or the hospital because we tried to do the thing. So to me, the question before whether she gets to decide, gets to know, is whether or not we, we give her the option. Well, whether she, we have to give, we have to let her involved in it, but whether we should. Do we want to or do we think we have to? So you're saying that this chart note needs to go back even further. Yeah. So way back at the beginning, when she was first given the option for surgery, the workup, she gets to the door, she says no. You want to know why that was the scenario? But doesn't that go back to the issue that she was incapacitated? So assuming that the surgeons had this conversation with her, but she wasn't able to effectively make a choice, and so they went ahead and did the assessment of her capacity and found her incapacitated, and then you have to go to the ethical consultation to see what's the best course of action. See, what I'm hearing, I, I think you're right, but what I'm hearing is also patient comes in gangrenous leg. Here's the decision tree. Patient comes in gangrenous leg, sent to surgeon to evaluate for amputation. 
see if patient can consent to amputation, do amputation. There's no other branch in that decision tree that says patient comes in with gangrene, call palliative care to see if amputation is the best option for this patient. If we had a bifurcated decision tree when the patient came in, this would look like a very different consultation. But that decision, that branch, isn't there. And, and until like she was being coerced. She didn't. In the first place. Come, come back to what she says back here. The patient consistently refused amputation. And this consultation was called to evaluate that refusal. Well, once she refused amputation, if palliative care were called, that would change the entire dynamic of this case. But that's not what ever happens. So it's a very different structure that we're dealing with. So. Because implicit in that is, is the calling of this, this refusal, as you said, because it's a standard of care, it's a, that's the only option. And refusal of the only option is, of course, irrational. Mm -hmm. And so now we have to deal with this irrational decision versus the, the possibility that it's not irrational at all and it makes perfect sense given her value. Exactly. But the structure to trigger that discussion doesn't exist. Yes? It's always, to me, a little, um, it makes me a little uncomfortable when we decide somebody doesn't have decision-making capacity because they don't, they don't agree with the standards the of medical care. care. <laughs> that they, that, that, that yeah. in itself is, it, to me, decision-making capacity has a wide range of possibilities. And so I, I think that we're, when we automatically say, well, she's not agreeing, therefore let's get it, we don't think she has decision-making capacity, that's right away a bit of a flaw. I, I agree with you, but I'm going to give you a rather long explanation of why I agree. <laughs> um, patients refusing standard of care don't necessarily lack capacity. However, when a patient agrees to the standard of care, we require less of the patient because our assumptions of what is in her best interest correspond with her behavior for what is in her best interest. When a patient refuses, it rends that fabric that supports treatment going on. And it's not the patient is refusing, the patient must be crazy or lack capacity. It's that if you get a patient who says, if this patient said, look, I'm 83 years old, I've lived a good life, I have multiple medical problems. Here they are. It's unclear to me if you do surgery that the wound will heal. And therefore, I'm telling you that it is in my interest not to have this surgery and return to the nursing home. It's in the proper consent process, but that isn't what occurs. That's right. We want all but, our patients to sound like medical officers. That's right. <laughs> but that's not what you get. And so you get a fuzzy, I don't want. And then you have to figure out this balance between her values and her best interests. Now, I can't remember what the chart note put. Ah, best interest. So the chart note identified that it's unhelpful to talk about best interest with this patient 
because best interest is what we use when we don't know anything about the patient and the patient's values, and here we know quite a lot. So the fact that someone argues it's in her best interest to have the surgery is ethically irrelevant to this case. Now, uh, please. Um, so we know that this patient has dementia, and we know that site consults were called, but I was wondering, is there any record of psych history prior to the gangrene? Um, in the list of medications, uh, there was Celexa and Depakote. And I'm wondering, is the Celexa for like dementia-related agitation, or is it for depression? Is Depakote for seizures, which aren't listed, or are they, is it for bipolar disorder? And the family also mentioned that she's not adherent to most recommendations uh, given by medical personnel. So uh, I'm wondering, could her decision-making ability uh, or difficulties with that be related to dementia, but also compounded by un undertreated mental health issues? Boy, that's a terrific comment. And my guess is off the top of my head with no data, boy, I bet you hit it on the head. I mean, this is a patient coming out of a nursing home who's got no involved family. Um, if you've got no involved family and you're alone in an institution, my guess is you, you're not getting the best care. Now, that's nasty. And you're getting too much medication. And you're probably getting too much medication. So we don't know what the Depakote, uh, we don't know. But, uh, I didn't see anywhere noted in the chart note that there had been a review of her overall psych status as opposed to a focused review of her capacity. So I think that's a terrific comment. Thank you so much. So here's the recommendation. Tell me what you think and how you would have done it differently. I'm troubled by the phrase truly understands. I think it asks too much of a patient like this. That's a very good comment. Right. Do we ever, do we ever truly? And does she need to truly understand? Look, this is a right. woman who clearly has diminished capacity. Um, I don't think a whole lot of patients have zero capacity. Well, no, yeah. Yeah, some do, but. I remember somebody telling me a long time ago that even patients who have almost no capacity probably have the capacity to report to health care proxy. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. I think in this case, to me, it's really about informed consent. And has less to do with capacity than a person's choice can only really be evaluated. It's only as good as what the options have been presented are. So you want to come back to your theme, I'm Barry, that, there, that you like, think surgery was really not a great option. It may have been a great option or not a great option, but I think in discussing it with the patient, if we truly want to be able to assess whether she's making a, a reasoned choice, we need to give her the pros and cons for herself. And I see no evidence that that has happened. Everyone's focused on... Yeah, it didn't. You're going to die from a gangrenous leg. That's what everyone's focused on. No one's focused on, by the way... You may not ever get off the ventilator, or you might not get out of the ICU, or you may live in the nursing home with hospice for another three months and be just like you are. So if you want to assess someone's capacity, before you get there, you've got to give them good stuff. Surgery is the knee-jerk response. It always yep. is the knee-jerk response. It's standard care for the Come back to person. my image. There's only one <laughs> branch in the decision tree that is no longer for a gangrenous issue. leg. If you look at how these things are in, uh, in the surgical, in the, I've obviously been involved in for this many, many times, and over years I think this has changed. If you look in the surgical textbooks, 
there is now a filter through goals of care around these kinds of things for patients with dementia. Right. In this case, there wasn't. Another. It wasn't in right. this case, but they're taught, these folks coming up now are in fact taught to consider goals of care when a person is a poor surgical risk. So that's the issue with this wow. lady. So that, that is Now there's someone who knows what she's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> that is that is really interesting. But I think over, and, and there's board questions for surgeons, especially vascular surgeons. Amputation is a huge production yep. around this. Yep. With, and more and more dementia talk has brought that out. Now I agree completely still, it is first a knee jerk and we usually get the consult on a refusal. That's clearly true. But usually they're relieved to hear, are you sure you should? Are you sure you want to? Thank God, I didn't want to cut off her leg. That's John so Arrows, by the way, would call that a cheap appeal to the text. I'm just saying. Comment. I want to go a little further than Barry. <clears throat> uh, I think everything you said is, is clearly right. I mean, who says this is even physiologically the, the best thing? Um, but what if it were? What if she could have another 10 years? Many people, you don't have to be old and a little bit fuzzy to be very worried about what it would be like after so many years to not have a leg or a foot. I mean, anybody, you don't have to be lacking uh, capacity to be back and to be wavering back and forth on that. Uh, so that's one thing. But um, I think your point about capacity, capacity for what in what context is very important in making more subtle our understanding of what all this emphasis on uh, patient autonomy is. Because, the, yeah, there are some decisions, very complicated decisions, a patient clearly wants to live, but doesn't have the capacity to decide between uh, treatment A, B, or C, right? Um, somebody has to sort of, get, given that their goal is to live as long as they can, somebody else is going to have to decide among those options. They're not capable of that kind of decision. But here, I think what you're emphasizing is either what I would consider to be a very modest, well, the real core of whose life is it anyway, whose body is it in any way, which can be ramified into some fancier notion of autonomy, but could be kept more humble. Um, and in the end, it can, it's really, uh, the, to me, it's not just the power differential, but the institutional setup, as you say, with or without power differential, that there's not a subtle, they're going down a checklist, and they don't really understand the ethical notions deeply enough, and my first good experience with medical ethics was reading your book, Ethics on Call. I think I learned, I think I got the spirit of this from, from your book long ago. And I've given, I've bought the book and given it to people, even long after it was released. So here's the thing though, I think there's something called humaneness. If this person has very stable uh, mindset and stable values, even though she couldn't you know, compute the difficult decision, even if it was physiologically better, you really have to take into account what the psychological impact on her will be. Um, and she wouldn't be alone in thinking, I don't know how I'm going to live without my foot. She's got a difficult enough life as it is. Something like this applies uh, also sometimes to adolescents, right? We want, we want their asset because otherwise it's inhumane. We're going to have to drag them kicking and screaming. And how important is this and how well will they be able to appreciate it after the fact? Uh, there you might have more opportunity to say, they'll be glad later. <laughs> but here, I don't think that really uh, computes. So I think, number one, it's not just do no harm, it's be humane, okay? And that's part of the reason why if somebody has fancy capacities, we want to respect those capacities because it's kind of cruel to say, well, you know what you're talking about, but we, but we are going, this is our procedure, we're going to do it, despite you. Nobody would say that. But even when somebody's just sort of, enough aware of what they care about in a stable, authentic sort of way, and this is going to be a tremendous blow psychologically to really So that's where I'm going a little beyond Barry. Barry's saying, you know, well, who knows, physiologically, this is probably a big screw-up, too. And, and I agree with that, most, in, in probably, at point. but I think you have to take the psychology of this into account, and that shades over eventually into, has rational capacity, you have to respect them as autonomous. That shades over when they've got all that. But when they don't have that, there's still something very important. Mm -hmm. it's, there, it's that person's life, it's that person's body. She's going to be living without that foot. Mm -hmm. um, and probably all these physiological complications. But certainly, you have to, you know, you, there's a weaker notion of autonomy or self-rule, which doesn't involve being a genius, just involves knowing, you know, having your own deep, stable, authentic identity. Her siblings got Hey. 
Her siblings got that. that. They, right. they could testify on that. Her siblings yeah, yeah, got that. That's right. That's where some of her evidence is from that, but that's why they even probably from her. As in the Claire so, Conway. So, I just, can I ask a question before you move on? That was a wonderful comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what do we think about the ethics of a case like this, which we know was several years ago? In the current environment, where permitting this patient to refuse the amputation will, in all likelihood, result in a 30-day readmission and a financial penalty to the hospital, I think that sets yeah. hospice. Hospice will bridge that. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Look, all bets are off on anything that's going to happen in the healthcare system uh, in the next year. Uh, I refer you all to Elizabeth Rosenthal has a brilliant, brilliant article in this Sunday's Times magazine on coding, which for most people who don't work in healthcare will come as a tremendous eye-opener for them. For the rest of us, it's just part of the ongoing headache. <coughs> but the disincentives for care, for good care, are likely to multiply in the next year or so. I, I just think it's inevitable. It's so awful. Yes. In, in all fairness to the system, which I think you've convinced me, at least, that needs some uh, <laughs> retooling and refining, isn't there, wasn't there a well-meaning motive here, namely, there's too much experience with old people just being dumped, as it were. And you know, they're old, they're, who cares? Uh, let's just warehouse them or let them fail. They, maybe they counter, in the effort to counteract that, <laughs> uh, we could save this person's life. Well, how much life is left? And how will they feel about having no leg? Uh, that somehow gets pushed hey. under. But there was, I don't think it was just to make money or just to be powerful. Oh, no, no. I think there was at least some. Motivation from never again will we let old people, you know, as in. Yeah, as no, in the, I, in the I, the I don't question the motives of these care providers or mm -hmm. the clinical ethics consultant. I, I think they were really trying to do their best. Yeah. But I think unpacking this case, as we did tonight, every time I talk about it, I learn more. But you had a comment too. Oh. Um, mine was on a question. I'm by no means anywhere close to a clinical ethicist. Um, but the, the question was <laughs> both the way. Well, you get there. You get there. Um, she used to think she wasn't an ethicist. I know <laughs> <laughs> um, she wrote a book, Ethics on Call. Uh, on the last slide, I, the one before was, this one. Uh, oh, on the last descriptive slide. Yes, right there. So the last line, she did state, you are trying to yeah, help me. Yeah. And that to me struck me as a, kind of a, an acknowledgement yeah. of, I know that you're here trying to do this. That was great. And yet, I still <laughs> don't want, I have my views and I'm OK. And I thank you for doing this, but yeah. not. So should that, yeah, should that not have had like more consideration in that she is fully acknowledging at that point mm -hmm. what we're trying to do? Right. And so at the end of the recommendation, it, it almost seemed like they were tentative to say that she had understanding, but that to me represented a whole lot more understanding. I, I, I like that point a lot. Let's see what, whoop, what they said in the recommendation. I, I thought that that spoke to, I like the fact that the ethics consultant put it in the note. In other words, remember that all of this that we're reading, I got from reviewing the note. So I'm looking for the narrative and the issues and the understanding. So I, I excerpted that because I, too, thought it was very powerful. And what, what, just, what just happened? There. So. Does this recommendation not ring clear enough to you in support of the patient? The, some of the text or choice of wording around the level of understanding, like 
uncertainty by no means certain. Well, it seems like there's enough indicators yeah. there that there's a higher level of certainty that is given credit to. What would you say? What would you say? I mean, the same determination. What? Uh, yeah, but, but how would you change the language? Oh, Go for it. Yeah, if you want to uh, 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 <laughs> um, I mean, through her consistent, that spoken choice, uh, through consistent spoken choice and acknowledgement of the actions and intentions of the care team and emphasis, we can reasonably say that she understands her situation and what it takes. That was awesome. That was terrific. Much better than what I thought. You're hired. Right. <laughs> no, that was terrific. You put that, that was terrific in your resume. Right. <laughs> um, I agree that those words, you're trying to help me, are important. But I'm also wondering, are those her words or are those words conveyed through an interpreter? Is this her exact language? Is there anything? Is she speaking English? And if not, is there anything lost in translation? It was in quotes, and I'm sort of vicious <coughs> in saying to people, if you put a quote a quote in your chart note, it better be a quote, because if it's a quote, I give it a lot more weight than anything else. So maybe least worst should not be quotes. <laughs> oh, that's quoting me. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's setting it off as a phrase. And it would right. include in the, it should include in the note that the translator was used to engage the person, right? About. Yes, no, this was direct, I gather. So last comments on this case, and what does it say about power differentials and doing clinical ethics consultation? I, I don't think it's as comprehensive as you were asking for, but on um, Duval's comment, I think it isn't just that she says, I know you are trying to help me, uh, so she's got some cognition here. I think it also reflects her, what, what emotions you could attribute to her. Her fearfulness, that hasn't got so far as to be so paranoid that you know, you're just trying to mess with me. But okay. she, that she could, I mean, I think it's a datum on her uh, having some possession of her feelings. You know, of, of course, it's everybody would be fearful about having a foot amputated. Um, as, as people get older, almost everybody gets a little bit more nervous about, about age and about whether other people care about you anymore. And, but, but, it, but clearly, having said that, this could be a paranoia, characteristic of a lot of people, particularly elderly people, that could skew her judgment and they could really do something better for her and she'd appreciate it a little while later. I think that remark carries a lot of weight, like she's got enough emotional um, uh, self-possession to say, look, please don't bother me. I know you're trying to help me. Yeah. Uh, I know you're good guys, but, but <laughs> you know, listen to me. I, it's, my, it's my leg, it's my foot, it's my le little bit of life that's left, or something like that. I, I think she's trying to say that. Of course, I didn't, wasn't going to hear it in Spanish or English. Um, so I like the fact that it's not just a cognitive, it gives her a little leg up cognitively but also in terms of uh, an aspect of, of, of sanity, if you will, even though she's limited in some ways. There's some decisions would be much too complicated or, or stressful for her to make at all. This one, you know, she wants to reassure me. I could give other examples from other contexts, but I won't look. We have something is said that shows you that they're not crazy. That's right. <laughs> that you're sounds, there. She sounds very sane to me. Um, um, something just strikes me a little odd about her statements, we're all trying to quote her saying, and we are, we're, we're trying to quote her saying, I know you're trying to help me. That's not what she said. She said, you're trying to help me. She didn't say, I know you're trying to help me. I know, I understand you're trying to help me. I see you're trying to help me. And so it just, it strikes me as a slightly odd statement if it's on its own, in quotes, exact, thing, exact words, you're trying to help me. Like, in what situations do you say that those exact words um, maybe it speaks to her mental status. Maybe she's somewhat, uh, you know, having a difficult time forming. I don't know. Does, does it strike anyone else as odd? A sentence. You are trying to help me. Well, the problem is, it's sort of take out of context. Yeah. You know, we're long, 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 three times removed. That's right. We have a note that someone wrote. So she's it's, it's hard. There's uncertainties about 
the yeah. degree to this to which this reflects yeah. the full reality, quote unquote. But I, I agree it would be better if, if she literally said, I know you're trying to help me. <laughs> but I think even without the I know a lot then would depend on the tone of it. You know, whether it's a kind of fearful, you're trying to help me. Meaning where meaning which is sarcastic or facetious versus you're trying to help me. You know. So well, Nancy, we like for our patients who are refusing treatment to have a lot of capacity. And we probably react badly when we get something less than what we're comfortable with. Well, I think that inherent in every case like this is the little risk management worm that has entered the heart of medicine runs it. Uh, and largely runs it. No, no, not largely, but it's always there. And whenever <clears throat> you decide not to remove a gangrenous leg, which is the paradigmatic case that we all deal with, which is why I love this case when it came over the transom recently, because I thought, Yet again, here we are. Um, there's concern that somehow the hospital has done bad by not doing good. And it's very hard to overcome that. And the more hospitals have such different cultures, so amazingly different, so I went from Montefiore, which at one point had this amazingly intellectual, fabulous risk manager who I just loved, who didn't worry about risk management. Mm -hmm. He worried about just <coughs> running the hospital well, and that was the best risk management. To other circumstances <laughs> I've been in where there's a lot of incipient paranoia about these sorts of issues. And it's just very hard to manage it. So um, thank you all. I, I thought your comments on this case were really wonderful. And I learned a lot from you all. And uh, thank you for coming.